You're listening to the Slavic Connection. <laughs> it's not uh, typical Texas. All right, I guess right. we'll get started then. Um, everybody, welcome to yet another uh, episode in our Connections Expert series. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out, and thank you, Dr. Surrey. Um, uh, Dr. Jeremy Surrey holds the Mac Brown Distinguished Chair for Leadership in Global Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin, our home. He is a professor in the university's Department of History and the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Um, he is a very widely published author, but his most recent book was Civil War by Other Means, America's Long and Unfinished Fight for Democracy. Please check it out. And thank you, Dr. Surrey. Thank you, Nicholas. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. Well, as we know, um, the title of our talk is A Multipolar Future, Democracy and the Authoritarian Challenge. Uh, so I think it would be great if we could start out, um, you know, this term multipolar world, um, it's used a lot, particularly by a certain president of the Russian Federation, uh, who seems to love that term very much. Um, what, in your opinion, does this mean? What is it, if there's a multipolar world or the vision of a multipolar world, what is it in opposition to? So it's a great question, Nicholas, uh, and the right place to start. Traditionally, international affairs uh, are built around the constituent elements of states and empires. And states and empires through most of history have had to balance one another, have had to interact with one another in unequal ways, but where no one state can dominate. So multipolarity, as we think about it, is the most natural state for international affairs where there are multiple unequal states. There might even be one that's more powerful than the others, but no one is powerful enough to dominate all of the others. And so you have a constant jockeying for position and for different interests. So your average high school playground or middle school playground is a multipolar world. <laughs> what is more rare are moments of hegemony when one power becomes strong enough to truly dominate and not need help from any other power, or moments of bipolarity, which is what the Cold War was, when there are two powers that rise to be strong enough uh, that they can actually dictate to the others to form one coalition or another. But bipolarity, which we became accustomed to during the Cold War, and I think Russians crave in some ways a mm -hmm. return to, uh, bipolarity and unipolarity or hegemony are the rarities in history. Multipolarity is the norm. Now, the challenge for President Putin is he's not really arguing for multipolarity. He's making that case. But he's arguing for a special Russian primacy in a particular part of the world. And that's different from multipolarity because if you measured the power of states today in any way, economic, uh, in terms of uh, influence in other areas, reach, uh, Russia would not be in the top tier of states. Um, but what Vladimir Putin is trying to do is push Russia into a multipolar position, but in a way that's really not multipolarity, but a special Russian position that he, feel, he feels Russians deserve. Yeah, and I, I mean, that's a common theme. I, I think even since uh, the Millennium speech, uh, the coming of the Millennium speech uh, that he gave in, uh, I think, January 30, or December 31st, 1999, uh, I think he was already touching upon that. Um, but, you know, when we look at kind of, I guess you could say right now is a challenge to the unipolar moment, um, you know, this, this, this appeal to multipolarity, it seems as if it's, and I, at least from the research I've done, mm -hmm. it's pointed towards what's now called the Global South, what was formerly called the Third World. Um, these countries that have, have experienced development that maybe feel as if they've been um, sidelined or feel as if they've lost a bit of their agency. Uh, and we have especially seen this with um, maybe the Israel-Gaza conflict yes. and how yes. um, certain UN votes have not gone the way that maybe American policymakers would like them to. Um, do you think that that multipolar, that call for multipolarity as maybe strategic and, and not untrue, but maybe, you know, strategic as it is, is it directly calling out to them maybe? I think so. But I think multipolarity in that sense is just a cover term for anti-Americanism. I think what Putin is, is pursuing in the third world is trying to mobilize opinion against the United States. And he sees the United States as a useful adversary in that sense. If he were pursuing a truly multipolar approach to the global south, 
there would also be a discussion of China's role in mm -hmm. that. Uh, there would be a discussion, for example, of India's role in certain parts of the global south. But instead, the way everything I've seen that like President Putin puts out there, it's very much in opposition to the United States. It's a critique in many cases of American capitalism or American military influence, American bases, American hypocrisy. And by the way, some of those critiques hold water. There, there is some truth to them. Mm -hmm. uh, even someone misusing history can have some truth in what they're doing. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, that multipolarity is an effort to mobilize anti-Americanism for Russian purposes. And this is the oldest of Russian foreign policy tactics. It goes back to the Tsar. In fact, uh, during the, the days of what was called the Eastern Question in the 19th century, right, uh, one of the mobilizing factors for the Tsar in what was then considered the Near East, what we would now call the Middle East and Central Asia, was a critique of British influence. Yeah. And so the Russians are playing the same game. Yeah, the, the, the great game between Britain and Russia, which later became kind of its own, I guess you could call it geopolitical folklore in, in the way that Britain and the United States as maybe a... Uh, an heir to the British, uh, the British foreign policy establishment. Um, but I, 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 you know, we use we we talk about the Cold War, and you know, I I was born after the culmination of the Cold War. But you're just showing off now. Aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, Cold War. The, I guess culmination is an interesting word because now we we hear talk, especially from American maybe policymakers and, and pundits about a new Cold yes, War. And yes. I, I've also heard terms such as the first and second Cold War within the larger term that we call the Cold War. So um, I guess in the term new Cold War, what, did, what have we failed to learn from the, the, the old Cold War, I guess? Oh, uh, there are so many things we have failed to learn from the old Cold War. I think there are two lessons we have learned, though. Let me start there. I think one lesson that we've learned that's very important for now is that the United States needs allies. One of the lessons of the Cold War was that the United States in its competition with the Soviet Union, allies were absolutely crucial. NATO was absolutely crucial to that story. Uh, and um, allies also differentiated the US system from the opposite system. We had certainly adversaries, but we had a wonderful string of allies, people who actually wanted to work with us. So the importance of alliances is a lesson I think we have carried over. And a second lesson is that uh, American strength is economic as well as military. And there has to be a balance between those two. I, I see those two points made quite frequently by both Democrats and Republicans. So I think we have learned those lessons. What are the lessons we haven't learned? Well, one thing we certainly haven't learned is that you have to be uh, forthright and willing to act when you see a threat before the threat metastasizes. It has been hard to persuade uh, some Americans, especially in recent months, to continue uh, the commitment to Ukraine. And not every foreign act of aggression is one the United States must respond to. But uh, if there is a lesson from World War II and the Cold War, it's that aggression, instability, warfare in precisely that part of Europe can undermine stability in what remains the most important were one of the two most important areas for both American political and economic influence. There's no future prosperity for the American economy without a stable Europe of one kind or another. That does not mean the United States should directly send its own soldiers to Ukraine, but it means that we have a stake in that battle. That has been hard to persuade Americans about because it seems far away. Yeah, do you think that it's, um, it's maybe hard because obviously we know that the later Cold War, the the kind of economic uh, maybe resurgence after stagflation and the and the the maybe hard harder times of the of the nineteen seventies, uh, and then of course the the boom times of the nineteen nineties. Um, do you think that it maybe it's harder to convince people, uh, especially after two thousand eight, especially maybe after the what is widely perceived as the failure of American foreign policy in Iraq and Afghanistan? Do you think that that maybe leaves a bad taste in the mouth of, of America, the American populace Absolutely. when they're making these decisions? Absolutely. That's very well put. Uh, I think there's a tendency in all societies to fight the last war. And the last war in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan didn't turn out the way we wanted it. We can argue over what actually happened, but it's very hard to, to code that as success. And so if you spend $6 trillion, which I think is what we spent between those wars, and you don't have the results that you expected, or were promised, it's hard to be optimistic, again, in a place like Ukraine. So that's part of it. But I think it's also really important to understand that 
the default historical position for many Americans is actually isolationism, not internationalism. Uh, we think of our recent history as being so internationalist. Uh, and yet uh, so much of American history is about Americans seeing themselves far away from a different world, a world that's not only a world of warfare, a world that's seen as corrupt, a world that's seen as not free in the way that we are. And it is not irrational for Americans to say, yes, this is terrible, but it's far away. Why should I solve this problem and not someone else? That is obviously not my position. But I think we as scholars and as internationalists ourselves, we need to understand that and we need to address that. Uh, and if we don't, it actually reinforces. If we're having an internationalist dialogue among ourselves that doesn't address those concerns, we're actually further alienating those beliefs, which might not be our beliefs, but are actually rational beliefs for people to have. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it brings up that metaphor that's been used over and over again in American history. The city on the hill yes. you know, is a fine metaphor, I suppose, if, if that's kind of the utopian vision you're looking for, but it kind of leaves the rest of the world in... Um, in shadow, in darkness, in the valley. I, I, I don't yeah. know if you're yeah. going to take the metaphor that far. But um, I think guess about passports as an example, right? I mean, um, it, it's, it's silly to ask anyone in Europe, uh, especially in one of the smaller countries on the continent, if they've traveled to a foreign country. Of course they have. They might not even need a passport now because of Schengen, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, most Germans living in the Rhineland have traveled to France or somewhere else, right? That's a natural thing to do. Uh, more than half of Americans don't even have passports, which means they haven't actually left the country. Uh, again, 95% of our students at the university have, have passports, but most Americans don't. It's striking. I guess, I guess you could say maybe, would, would you describe the kind of default, if there could be a default American position as maybe a, a reluctant internationalism? Yeah. Because we know that maybe in the post-war order, um, there are lots of international institutions, you know, the, the kind of lesser known fact about World War II is the name of the allies was the United Nations. So uh, it's, um, do, you, do you think that there, there's maybe a longer history of that, of engagement with international institutions, maybe going this far, but no further, because I know that there's lots of critiques of international criminal court and America's, uh, I think there's some uh, the Hague Invasion Act is is a term I've heard mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. that America is committed to invading the Netherlands if an American citizen is uh, is put in front of the the Hague Criminal Court. So I think uh, there is a long, deep, and necessary history of American engagement with the wider world. Even isolationists are engaged with the wider world uh, because that's the way a global economy operates, right? So let's just uh, take the you know the sugar that's in my coffee right now. Actually, there's no sugar in this coffee, but there could be. Uh, <laughs> that sugar would come from outside the United States, most likely, right? Uh, the pineapple we enjoy eating, right? That comes from Hawaii, which is now part of the United States, but for most of the 19th century was not. So even the most basic levels, right? Our consumer culture, our basic economy, right? Is part of a global economy. Anyone who's in the oil industry knows this too, right? The price of oil is actually not determined by Americans. It's determined by a global market for oil. So there's engagement with the world. And of course, so much of our society is composed of people who came from somewhere else, right? Right now, there are more Americans who were born overseas than there have been since the late 19th century. So we are a society with lots of connections, but that's different from the politics of our society, right? The politics in the United States are hyper-national. This is always what strikes foreigners, I think, ac accurately, right? They're hyper-internal, but yet our economy and our culture is internationalist. So you can be culturally internationalist, you can be economically internationalist, as anyone in the oil industry is, and still mm -hmm. politically isolationist. It's incredible. That's incredibly interesting. Uh, I want to turn now maybe to um, a term that that is often was often used in internationalist language: globalization. And um, did globalization fail to bring about universal values, especially in the geopolitical sphere? So globalization did not bring about universal values, but I don't think it ever was intended to do that. People might have thought that would happen, but that's a misunderstanding of history. The dynamics of history are generally that uh, you get common experiences across societies that get localized in their own unique ways. So Christopher Bailey, the late Oxford historian, made this point very well about the 19th century. Right? He pointed out in a wonderful book on the 19th century that, uh, for example, 
uh, people in very different societies are confronting the railroad for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, they are confronting in the early 20th century radio for the first time. So there are these global dynamics and radio and the railroad connect the world, right? They connect the world in certain ways. There are global dynamics, but their meaning is different in different cultures and societies that a common set of structural experiences can be defined and given meaning in different ways in different societies. Uh, and, and that's, of course, why it's so important to have area studies and to be familiar with the languages and cultures of other sides. I'm giving a, a promotion for what you do here, Nicholas, because <laughs> you. that's what allows you to understand how other societies see these common phenomenon. If you think the common phenomenon are defined the same way across societies, you're not paying attention. You're not paying attention. So, so for example, we're all on the internet. The internet has globalized the world, right? We, it has. I mean, with very few exceptions, people now communicate and get their information through the internet. But boy, does it mean something different in Russia mm -hmm. than in the United States. And boy, does it mean something different in one part of Austin from where you come from in another part of Texas, mm -hmm. right? So, so the meaning attached to certain things will be localized. In fact, in that sense, common phenomenon can increase localism and increase differences. And that's what's happened. So globalization has worked. It's put us all on the internet. And now we have found more ways to create niche identities. So we're connected by the internet uh, and we're separated by the different meanings we bring to the internet. That's actually a good thing. Fascism, authoritarianism would be the effort to make us all think the same way. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I find that really interesting, especially because I had been thinking about um, is this call for a multipolar world, is this kind of, I, I guess you could say, um, this kind of resistance against any sort of uh, attempts at, at retaining U.S. hegemony in the international system, can this be seen as kind of an insurgency against a U.S. global order that that we, we've seen the Internet, especially the Internet, used, I mean, you know, telegram channels that have been integral into the promotion of, of, of Russian state talking points, um, one of our first experts talks was actually about this, um, yep. about the use of, of, of the internet to spread regime talking points. And of course, I'm, I'm reminded of, uh, in the mid, mid, uh, 20 teens about, um, Islamic terrorists, uh, using, uh, the internet to recruit and to kind of spread their propaganda. So, um, it, it, is, is this maybe a global insurgency? Are these globalized pathways ways to challenge the international order. Absolutely. I mean, I think there are counter hegemonies, as Gramsci would say, that, that emerge as insurgencies within the hegemony of one system. So there is a U.S. system in the world. I mean, just the role English plays as a lingua franca uh, around the world, the role of the dollar. I mean, there, there's nowhere in the world you would go now where people don't save money in dollars if they can, right? And there are very few places where people save money in rubles. <laughs> Even Russians don't want to save money in rubles, right? Uh, so, they're, they're, I mean, the dollar becomes a de facto currency, right? When my kids travel abroad, I always tell them, have a few $20 bills in your pocket if everything else is lost, right? You can get somewhere if you hold up a $20 bill, right? Again, if I hold up a 20 ruble note, it's, it's worth nothing, right? So you don't get anywhere that way. So there are these ways in which the rules of the system, as Charles de Gaulle said in the 60s, right, give an exorbitant privilege to the United States. <laughs> There's such an advantage. We are so privileged to be fluent in English, to be paid in dollars. And we can go on and on and on, right? Mm -hmm. What that though enables is that standardization of certain things can be given meaning and used by people who have different aims. So the North Koreans play this game very well, right? Mm -hmm. They counterfeit dollars. <laughs> so they're able to manufacture wealth and they do it really well. So they're using our system against us I think as a good um, student of the KGB, of the KGB, Putin learned this as well. And he learned and can think about and conceptualize the internet as a space dominated by the United States. And because it's dominated by the United States, it creates more American vulnerabilities because so much of our stuff is there. How can you operate? How can you operate a city today in the United States without using online platforms to control the energy? and things of that sort. So that provides a vulnerability. So exactly as Gramsci would think about it, right, the, the standardization and the dominance of a particular pathway of action means that that pathway is now more important for the dominant actor 
and it becomes a sitting duck that mm -hmm. can be turned against the dominant actor as well. Yeah, and, and I, I guess returning to what we talked about earlier about multipolarity being the norm and unipolarity or bipolarity being the exception, d does a hegemony kind of naturally, I mean, there, there's uh, uh, the term uh, Thucydides trap uh, mm -hmm. where, where mm -hmm. kind of the arising actor feels the, the need to challenge the already dominant actor in order to maybe prove uh, their, their worthiness or, or to establish themselves and that draws the actors into a, uh, a kind of struggle that an existential struggle in a way. Yeah. So I, I, I differ with uh, my friend Graham Allison, who, who's talked about a Thucydides trap mm -hmm. uh, in, in part, because I don't think that's what Thucydides meant, first of all, but that's just the historian knew it in me. Uh, but, but the reality is, I think that a system of hegemony, of course, uh, encourages other rising powers to challenge the hegemon, but more often than not, those other rising powers, i.e. China today, see an interest in the system too, because the system is helping them to rise. The challenge the Chinese have is they resent American domination of this system. They resent our presence in Taiwan, for example, right? But they also benefit from that very system. Their, their, their economy is as connected to the capitalist world system as ours is. In fact, they might be even more dependent uh, upon that system, right? And the more that they invest in that system to challenge us, the more that system has to thrive for them. The real challenges to hegemony historically come from just what you were talking about so well before, Nicholas, insurgent elements, mm -hmm. much smaller elements, elements that actually see an opportunity in using the system to blow it up. So what makes it very hard to deal with North Korea or with Russia today is that they are not, I don't think Putin actually cares about the future prosperity of his own country. So he doesn't have an interest in working within the system for that reason. He is instead trying to boost himself and a political agenda that might run against the interests of his own country and using the system to boost those interests. So he, has an, he now has a value he attaches to actually undermining the system, even when the system helps his citizens. That's the opposite from the Chinese. As, as, as aggressive as Xi Jinping is, I think in the end, Xi Jinping wants a system in place that feeds Chinese citizens. He doesn't want to deal with, I mean, the, the brain drain that Russia has experienced mm -hmm. since, it's, since it invaded Ukraine is the kind of disaster China would never want. And that explains the different behavior between the two of them. And that's why I find Russia more threatening, because they don't have an interest of working within the system in the way the Chinese do. That's why North Korea is so threatening. That's why terrorism is so difficult mm -hmm. to respond to. Yeah, I, I, you, you anticipated my next question, which is what, what is the primary danger? Obviously, we've seen with the Russo-Ukrainian war, the, the kind of the, the challenge, of course, the, the narrative coming out of Russia is that they were forced into this. And I'm of the party to believe that in a way they perceive it, they, their perception was that they were kind of, this is the last straw that if, if we don't challenge them now then then it'll be it'll be even worse what do you do you think that maybe the recent history uh you know the 2011 2012 um protests the kind of the well now um significantly uh damaged navalny movement and things uh like that do you think that those uh, inculcated a sort of a paranoia that that maybe was reminiscent of, of soviet paranoia about about American, the American challenge? I, I'm sure there's something to that. It's a very intelligent argument you make, as, as always, Nicholas. I think, it's, I think there's a lot to that. Um, but it's hard for me to see that as the main factor here, because I think there were so many opportunities for Russia to respond to what it saw perhaps legitimately as threats to, to itself. And Putin was firmly in control of Crimea, and no one was about to dislodge him from Crimea two years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was probably on the verge of getting that recognized by most of the world. Mm -hmm. So it's hard not for me to see this as more an opportunistic move on Putin's part. I think he saw an opportunity in his eyes to um, split the Western alliance. And he believed that he would achieve something that he's personally very much committed to. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps his paranoia is that is a kind of more traditional Slavophilic paranoia, if, if I can put it that way. There's nothing wrong with being a Slavophile, but mm -hmm. the paranoid version of that is that the growth of the West is inevitably smothering our Slavophilic virtue, what, mm -hmm. what you know, Tolstoy called the Russian douche, right? That, that this is going to be smothered. So I bet there is some of that there, but I think the decision to move then 
and to move in such an overwhelming way uh, was a gambler's risk thinking there was an opportunity to run the table. Mm -hmm. and, and we have to recognize the fact that he came close, that the, you know, the United States told Zelensky to leave. It's a different world, right? If, if Zelensky flies out on an American jet and is in New York now or D.C. or London, uh, this, is a, this is a different world, right? So Putin might, have, might, might not have been unintelligent <laughs> to take this risk. But as any you know, scholar of war and history would tell you, as Clausewitz would tell you, right, you, you can't anticipate the fog and the friction mm -hmm. and the best laid plans can be undermined. And there's a counter reaction, which is, I think, what we've seen, especially in Finland and Sweden. I mean, if two years ago, Nicholas, you would ask me, would, will Sweden and Finland join NATO in the next 10 years? I would have said no. And now here we are two years later and they're members of NATO with Viktor Orban's approval also. Right. Pretty extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, I, there, there was certainly there's certainly some expert deal making that that went on to do yes. that. I mean, that's a part that's a main part of diplomacy, right? Is the, the wheeling and dealing, uh, maybe a little bit of the used car salesman in there. But uh, I think but, Victor Orban's Swiss bank account has grown a lot in the last few weeks. I, I I don't have a way to check, but I will I will defer to yeah your educated yeah. guess. Uh, the uh, so so you would say that this gamble has not paid off. That, it has that, not paid. I think Russia has already lost. That doesn't mean Putin has lost, but Russia has already lost. I mean. I think about as a historian, what is it that provides strength, prosperity, um, all the good things we want in any society, right? Uh, and Russia has lost all of those. Its most talented people have left and they are not coming back. I am yet to meet that talented Russian computer engineer who went to Armenia and said, you know what, now that I think about it, Putin's not so bad, I'm gonna go back, right? Now he's killed Navalny. I mean, this is where I wanna live. Right. So he's he's depleted their talent. And we all know in the global economy of today, talent is one of the most important things. Mm -hmm. Then the war itself has been enormously costly in terms of Russian lives. So those who stayed uh, have suffered through the war. Uh, and although he has been able to finance the war effort, he has had to underinvest systematically in various other things at home. So he has he has basically uh, forced Russia into a position of 10 to 20 years of catching up to where it was when the war started. That's a loss for Russia. You know, and as someone who studies Russia and loves the Russian people, that's terrible. And, and those are just facts. Those are not opinions. Now, he might have other aims and he might still be able to come out of this himself being able to say he's the next Russian conquistador and he's acquired, you know, that, that's a different thing. Putin can still win, but Russia has lost and that's terrible. Yeah, I, 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 you know, uh, maybe to turn to to history. I know that you've written uh, about the Civil War, and and as I was thinking about this, uh, uh, about what we were going to approach in this conversation, I I kept thinking about, you know, can can we maybe see some, uh, you know, history never repeats, but it rhymes. Um, can the Civil War, World War II, these type of conflicts also be seen as these kind of gambles by forces that feel as if they're being pushed? I know that in the Civil War, the, the Southern aristocracy felt that it was under existential imminent threat from the abolitionist movement. In World War II, you know, the, the German archives are replete with calls that, that, you know, the Soviet Union was the icebreaker hypothesis sure, that, that sure. the Soviet Union was just itching to invade Germany at, at un, until the, Operation Barbarossa, they caught him off guard. So can, can, can we maybe see some, beyond the Cold War, can we see some, some, some parallels? In it's history? a great question. And it's one of the core historical questions. Why do wars start? Why do wars start? And the truth is that most wars, most wars, uh, of course, there are big exceptions, but most wars don't start because some man decided to start a war. Uh, now, that is what happened in World War II to some extent, mm -hmm. right? There is a simple explanation for World War II in Europe. Adolf Hitler, right? And there's a simple explanation for the war in Ukraine, Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. If Putin had died of a heart attack two days before the invasion was launched, there would not have been an invasion. We wouldn't be here, mm -hmm. right? And if Hitler were killed in a car accident in 1936, Joachim Fest, the great biographer of Hitler wrote, you know, if Hitler had been killed in a car crash in 1936, people would have said he was the great leader of the 1930s because Germany had done better coming out of the depression because of the command economy, and he hadn't invaded anyone yet, nor had he killed any, well, he actually killed some Jews, but he hadn't done it in any systematic way yet. So uh, that indicates to us in these two cases, right, if you could pull one man out and you wouldn't have a war, that one man caused a war, but that's usually not how wars uh, are caused. I spend a lot of time with students trying to explain World War I was not World War II, right? No one actually wanted this war. 
And the civil war in the United States is, is simple, more similar to World War I, mm. insofar as Southern Confederates in places like Texas are committed to holding on to their slaves. Mm -hmm. But they really believe that that commitment and showing that commitment and then firing on Fort Sumter would lead unionists just to say, okay, okay, it's not worth the effort. And by the way, they were close to getting that, mm -hmm. right? And when you get to 1864, when Lincoln, and this is a moment we should all be proud of, those of us who care about democracy, a president at war stands for an election, an election he thinks he's gonna lose. Mm -hmm. If McClellan had won that election because Northerners were tired of the war, you would have had a deal of some kind. Whether it would have lasted very long is another question, right? So oftentimes countries or entities will undertake belligerent action believing they're going to avoid a war or believing they are going to get a negotiated outcome that they want. What is rare is what we saw with, and I'm not saying Hitler and Putin are the same, but where you have one leader who decides it doesn't matter what the risks are, it doesn't matter what the alternatives are, I am going to go to war because I'm superior and because I have a right to do this and because I've made that personal commitment and to have enough power to, to pull that off. Mm -hmm. I, 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 to this day, don't think Xi Jinping could do that. I think Xi Jinping could lead us into a war inadvertently, which is Graham Allison's argument in the, in the Thucydides trap. But I don't think the Chinese system is such that one leader can say, we're going to go into a full scale war against the United States tomorrow. I don't think our system is built that way. Yeah, a little bit maybe too integrated. I mean, I'm sure that that every person in here is is wearing something or holding something that was made in the People's Republic Precisely. of China, and Precisely. probably without any any thought to it. And I think that 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 especially in in the 21st century is is kind of a defining element of the American economy. Right. But it doesn't they, mean we couldn't accidentally end up in a war. The nightmare scenario, right, is that the Chinese do think they can take Taiwan back. <laughs> and they act and then we react and similar to World War I. This is precisely Graham Allison's argument mm -hmm. that you get action reaction escalating to war. That's very different from what happened in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. This was not that. And that's very different from how World War II starts in Europe. Yeah, it's, um, I, I, I guess to maybe turn to that, uh, that what you said about the deal. Um, obviously we have an upcoming American election um, you know, you, you study American democracy. It's one, it's one of your, uh, your, your focuses. Um, is there a possibility that maybe a challenger to the current administration who will remain unnamed, uh, the, uh, could be seeking to make a deal as some sort of, um, as to, to appeal to maybe the, the isolationist, um, feelings that, that, that could be seen as a default in the American populace. I think that's exactly the strategy of the challenger to this administration, uh, to say that uh, we as a country are not taking care of the people who should be taken care of, who tend to look a certain way and live in certain areas, and that you're being insulted, you're being uh, neglected, and I'm gonna serve you and not waste your resources and time on other things, and I'm gonna go so far is maybe I'll even form an alliance with this other bad guy because you know what? Uh, he can serve his people, I can serve my people, right? I mean, that, 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 that also has a lot of historical grounding to it, right? Mm -hmm. Those who see themselves responding to historical grievances can often see, see partnership in that. It doesn't mean they're the same and it doesn't mean that Putin is a puppeteer uh, pulling the strings on Donald Trump but it does mean that they see some mutual identity. They both see themselves fighting the same internationalists that you described so well before, Nicholas. They both see themselves fighting the same intellectuals. That's us. They both see themselves right, fighting against certain institutions that they see limiting their power, like courts. Yeah. Things of that sort. Yeah, it's, and I mean, you know, this, this at least would be a, a critique of, of at least the way that democracy is structured in, in the mass media age uh, that, uh, that there, there's a tendency to uh, create scapegoats to yes. to maybe uh, to blame external factors. I, I know there's a book, uh, Democracy for Realists, that uh, that makes this case that uh, that sometimes completely random, unrelated things can have a larger impact than direct policy actions totally. in elections. So, so do you think that that maybe, and, and that's not even to speak of direct manipulation, which obviously has been the has been uh, put forward as an explanation by many people ever since 2016, and I, I mean, arguably even before then. Um, so, so what do you do? You think that that maybe 
those things have an outsized role on on the way that elections may turn out or or how how engaged people feel in the in the political battle going on? So I think elections are like uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace. Um, they're the most unpredictable things, except once you know the outcome. <laughs> right. Um, and and uh, what the mystery for Tolstoy that I think is the mystery of elections. Right. He says it, you know, page 763 or so. Right. Which is that uh, armies move one direction for a while and then they move the other direction. And the general claims I was in charge. <laughs> I was making this happen, right? But his whole point is, right, the French army is moving towards Russia, not just because Napoleon commands it, but then all of a sudden, there's a moment, there's a breaking point, right? And they move the other way, <laughs> and Napoleon can't stop them, right? That the movement of people, and I think that's what happens in voting, too. We put billions of dollars, probably trillions every year, into polling, micro-polling, and we still don't know what's going to happen, right? We still don't know what's going to happen, yet 99% of the people already made up their minds. So what's happening? It's who shows up, who doesn't show up. It's if something at the last moment that triggers someone to not show up or to not vote or to vote when they weren't going to vote, all sorts of things uh, like that. I think there is a trend. There's a way that you can see things moving, but that is never baked in. And external actors, unpredicted actions, uh, events that are even random can have a huge, a huge impact. Uh, now, it's interesting because I think certain actors try to game that. I'm convinced, I can't prove this, but I'm convinced that uh, Putin killed Navalny on the eve of the Munich Security Conference intentionally, that that timing was not random, right? First of all, we know Putin's obsessed with the Munich Security Conference. This is where he's gone a few times and really tried to give his most outrageous speeches. For whatever reason, he thinks that's the forum of the Western cabal <laughs> against him. And... Um, I think he was, this is again a guess, but just looking at his historical record, I think he thought, you know, this was going to be a conference where the Biden administration was going to try to show people in the U.S. and abroad, we've got things under control, even though these pesky few Republicans, right, the majority will actually vote for Ukraine aid if it actually gets to the floor. But because there's a, a group who are trying to stymie us, nonetheless, we can bring our European allies together. We can show a united front. This is what people wanted to do at that conference, and that's politically valuable for for. Biden, I think uh, Putin was showing no way. That's not true. He was trying to make Biden and Harris and then others look weak by saying on the eve of this big meeting, look what I can get away with. Um, and, and so that's an effort. And, and does that change the way people view things? I expect more bad behavior from Putin as we get closer to November. I think that election is as important to him as it is to us. And he's going to try to do all kinds of things. And, and, and I don't know where it's going to come out. I think we're generally pretty well prepared because he's got a long track record. It's not 2016. We've come a long way. We have lots of students from our program here, right, who are doing this work through the disinformation lab and other things, right? So we're ready, but you never know. Never well, know. he's he's already exposed who who he'll be voting for, which yes. uh, apparently is the is the sitting president. So I I found that pretty interesting. But uh, but um, do you think maybe that when when we see maybe the two main challengers to the international order, Russia and China, these are both they could be called authoritarian systems. Yes. I know in one, it's obvious that there's maybe more centralized power in Russia with the person of Putin, and then maybe more party control in, in the People's Republic of China. But um, do you think that they may see, see themselves as, as more secure because they don't have to contend with these kind of actual oppositions that, that yeah. maybe administrations in the United States face, especially in this new electoral order where elections are much, especially on the elector in the electoral college, are totally. incredibly close. Totally. Yeah, well, the posture of authoritarians is always that we're more stable and we can make long-term uh, decisions. And then with the Chinese, this gets doubly rolled into the myth of long-term Chinese thinking. So the Chinese say, we always think in 500-year terms, Americans think in five years, but also we have an authoritarian system, so we don't have to change people every few years on mm -hmm. the way you do. So that's always the posture, and I think there is a short-term advantage in that. Mm -hmm. In the long term, the historical record, at least so far, has been that there's actually a disadvantage in that. There are two dynamics, among other things, that occur in authoritarian systems. Both of these things are happening in China and Russia right now. One is the groupthink phenomenon. Right? In an authoritarian system, it's very hard to get, if you're the authoritarian, to get good information. 
uh, we have to recognize we probably understand what's happening in Ukraine better than Putin does. Right? Why is that? Because we get many different news sources. There's still propaganda we're confronted by and how we sift through that. But if you're an intelligent, educated consumer of information, you can get really good information. It's very hard for anyone to tell the emperor that he's failing because you don't live very long thereafter, right? So people in those positions get told what they want to hear. It's the same, the same thing happens on a much smaller scale to professors, right? When students want letters of recommendation from me, I mean, they're, you know, I'm the greatest thing ever when they come into my office, right? <laughs> I mean, so th there's a problem of authority in an authoritarian system for good information. And that's why a lot of authoritarian systems make big mistakes. Uh, second problem, the Soviet Union had that had mm -hmm. that problem in spades. Yeah, you're reminded. I'm, I'm immediately reminded of the nomenclatura and how they. I mean, by the 1980s, by Chernobyl, there's no information transfer even between the different uh, apparatuses within the Soviet government, which is catastrophic. In many uh, precisely. Ways. Yeah. So there's the information problem, and then the second problem in an authoritarian system is the succession problem. Right now, you could say we have a succession problem, but you know, democracies have proven, perhaps with the exception in 2020, but even there it did work out, right? That they can do a peaceful transfer of power. It's the hardest thing historically, right? The most effective way to transfer power historically was to have a son, but it was a problem if you had two sons, right? Uh, and this is a real problem that these systems have. The Chinese had created a party system for succession and Xi Jinping has destroyed that by making himself president for life. Think about Putin, what is gonna happen? We were actually thinking about this during the early part of the Ukraine war in the United States. And we came to the conclusion, actually, that the replacement of Putin could be even worse because mm -hmm. it could actually be someone who is, has to take incredible military action just to stay in power, right? And so succession is a problem in the long term for any authoritarian system. Democracies have proven not flawless, but better at this. I mean, we had a president of the United States who clearly did not want to leave office. And there was some violence, of course. But the optimistic view of what happened in 2021, early 2021, is he was forced to leave office. And he did leave office. And the new president came in. And there was a transfer of power. Boy, was it messy. But that happened. That's victory in most systems. That's rare in any authoritarian system. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean you, you're reminded, uh, maybe I'm, I'm reminded of uh, certain episodes in the 1990s with the transfer from the Soviet system to the Yeltsin presidency. Yep. I mean, hundreds that, uh, you know, the numbers that in America would be, would be even more shocking than what happened. And, and that maybe, you know, it, our, our media environment plays, plays a role in this and in, in that there's a, there's a drive to, to really, um, to, to make events out to be, to be really shocking for, for certain things. And, and I think that there, there's a truth in that, but, but maybe, uh, do you, do you think that maybe the media has, has, overplayed certain events um, in the public imagination uh, for maybe economic reasons, and then those become uh, maybe maybe shibboleths or, or become the boogeymen in the, you know, I'm, I'm obviously talking about January 6th, which has become yeah. sort of like, a, like this rep repeating nightmare uh, of people, of people who, who are, were used to this peaceful transfer of power, regardless of how maybe vicious the electoral campaign was. Yeah, so I think there is a way in which certain events get sensationalized, and there's a way in which our critics, particularly in Russia, want to use the sensationalization of those events to undermine our faith in our democratic institutions, right? And there's no doubt, there's a lot of evidence for those people who study this more than I do know the more of the details on this. But for example, the Russians are constantly throwing out propaganda that we're seeing on our phones, telling us that our judicial system is not a real judicial system, mm -hmm. that it's dominated by whoever the bad guys are. And, and certain people are being tried because they're bad guys in office who are answering to the president. I mean, stuff that's clearly not true. Um, so there is some of that, there's no doubt. Uh, but I will also say there's certain events that are incredibly striking, important, and um, need to be grappled with in the United States because they are so unprecedented. So what happened on January 6th is not unprecedented for other societies, but it is for the United States. And let me be even more specific about that, right? That you had not only a president who didn't want to leave power, but actually was part of an organized insurrection. And I think there's no doubt he was part of it. Whether what part he was playing is debatable in court cases now. Uh, more than 1,100 people, right, have been convicted. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and why is that significant? Why is that not an exaggeration to focus on that? Well, because the violence they brought to bear could have very well uh, resulted in major deaths to American elected officials. That's really serious. Mm -hmm. Could they have brought the republic down? No, that's an exaggeration. But could we have had a situation where Mike Pence or Nancy Pelosi were seriously injured? Anyone who's looked at this would have to say yes. They would have to say yes. That is very serious, especially if that injury is connected to their con carrying out their constitutional order. I mean, let's be clear. The vice president of the United States, who's not my favorite person, was doing his constitutional duty and his life was imperiled by fellow Americans from that. That, that is a major story. That's not an exaggeration. And those responsible for that have to be held accountable. We're a society of laws, right? We're a society of laws. So I think it is appropriate to focus on the law breaking and appropriate to focus on people doing things that we would not tolerate under any other circumstances. But it is certainly, as you say, correct to put that in the context of our larger system. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's, it's, it's been talked about a lot that there's a, there's a very, uh, there's a very, thick border between, um, you know, political rhetoric, even even as extreme as it gets, and actual mass public violence, because, you know, that's when you really see the the not only the the damage to the regime, to the legitimacy of institutions, but damage to the culture as a whole. And, and I mean, you know, God knows how many what scars are left from Tiananmen, uh, from, you know, the the putting down of 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 dissidents in Russia. I mean, obviously, the Navalny example is, is right. a very targeted example, but is emblematic of the way that, that oppositions are treated. And, and that is a completely different stage. Yes. And what we have to guard against, we're in a very different situation from other countries, thankfully. We're very fortunate in the United States. But we do have a long history of people using power and violence in ways not as atrocious as in Russia or China, but using power and violence to intimidate and bully people. That is another authoritarian tactic, right? Uh, we have a long history of lynchings in the United States, and lynchings were uh, crimes committed by organized posses, organized groups of men, usually in communities, who undertook vigilante violence, not only to punish a perpetrator, a black man who tried to um, have a relationship with a white woman, not only were they policing that line and that person, they were trying to intimidate anyone else who would dare to cross that line. And what has happened in the United States in the last 10 years, and it's nowhere near as bad as it is in Russia, obviously, but we still need to call this out, right, is that some people are afraid not just to voice their opinion because they think people disagree with them, but they, they fear for their own safety in cases. And, and that, that lets the bullies win. That's, that's authoritarianism at work. That should never be acceptable in our society. Yeah, and uh, you know this this whole conversation we've really been we, we've we've had our feet on, on left foot in history and right foot in the present. Um, and you you wrote a chapter in uh, a book called Applied History and Contemporary Policy Making, and I really love this term applied history. Um, and I wanted to get maybe your maybe to to wrap us all up to talk about the purpose of the university and the purpose of talking about history, because I know that uh, lots of the criticism of the university and, well, actually very recently has been that, you know, head in the clouds, intellectuals just kind of babbling about, which is obviously not true. But uh, I think that this term applied history can really address that. How, how do you imagine that term? It's a great question. Yeah. It's a great question. You know, I think all policy is applied history. I think all policy is applied history, all good policy, I guess, right? Uh, because applied history is understanding where the actors who matter for you have come from. Uh, Ernest May and Richard Neustadt call this placing people, placing people. The only way you can know who you're negotiating with or who you're trying to influence or who you're reacting to, who they are, where they come from, what they do, is by historicizing them. You know, we tend to put people in categories when we don't know their history. And those categories often look right to us, but they're totally misapplied, right? We, we fell into this with Saddam Hussein, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing good to say about Saddam Hussein. Don't worry, I'm not going to say he was he had a, a nice good, pool. <laughs> a lot of nice palaces, too. Yeah. A lot of nice, he had good choice in real estate. Um, but you know, what you could say about this was that the United States had a category we put him in. But we didn't actually understand him. We didn't understand the society he was in. That doesn't mean we were wrong to want him 
out of office, but we didn't understand what would happen when he left office. I think there's a similar point one could make uh, about American views uh, to some extent of the Taliban, right? Again, there's nothing good to say about the Taliban, right? But they're not just a group of extremists. They're not just a group of Muslim extremists. There's something much more going on there, right? And we put institutions and groups that we don't like into categories. We don't historicize them. We don't understand where they come from. And then we're not in a position to actually deal with them. Applied history is using the knowledge of the past to situate who it is you're dealing with today. It's what we do in our relationships, right? Mm -hmm. You form a relationship with someone because you learn their history and then you share some of that history. And if you don't learn their, that history and you don't share their history, they're usually not a friend of yours. Mm -hmm. That's called an acquaintance then, right? And so understanding where people come from is the key application of history to then making good decisions about what to do now. Because if you don't know who you're dealing with, you cannot actually make productive decisions. So any good negotiator will tell you that, right? You want to be the one sitting at the table that knows the most about what people are bringing to the table. Any good gambler will tell you that, right? Uh, I like to play cards, right? And one of the most important things is to size up the people around the table. And the best way to size them up is to think, you know, where, where did they come from before they were playing here? <laughs> And when do they play? And what are they looking for? What do they care about? And are they play, playing for money now? Right? Are they desperate? Are they not desperate? Right? And, and what's really interesting to me about applied history is the answers to some of these questions are not clear. I mean, we've studied Putin's history in depth. But there's still a lot we don't understand about it. And those are the debates worth having. Because those are the debates that will help us understand what he's likely to do. We cannot predict the future, but we can understand the past that has brought us to the cusp of the future have a better sense of what might happen in the future. So I guess in a way you could, uh, by the way, I'm going to use that tactic. I'll, I'll be in Vegas soon, so I'm going to use that go. tactic. There you go. There um, you go. I encourage but, you to do that. I encourage but, uh, you to do that. Do you, do you think that this moment, uh, you know, there's been many programs have ended, obviously, for safety reasons mainly, but, um, you know, the the China is, is still relatively open for, for study and things of, of that sort. So do you think that this tense geopolitical moment, this tense historical moment calls for more engagement and not less? Yes. I, I've never believed that there is a reason why when you have bad relations with a society, you should cut them off. Just the opposite. Those who have bad relations with you should study more, should connect with them more. So I'm against ever closing an embassy in a country. Uh, Woodrow Wilson closes the American embassy in Russia after the revolution, mm -hmm. right? Um, President Truman closes the embassy in what is then Peking, now Beijing, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I think the U.S. embassy in Tehran is closed by the Iranian students, but it's never reopened, right? So those are three examples where the United States has said these are horrible regimes, communist Soviet Union, communist China, uh, the Ayatollahs, Iran. They're so horrible. We are going to make a statement about how much we disapprove by not having an embassy. I believe in all three cases, the evidence is clear that has harmed us. That has harmed us. Because we're not there then, first of all, to follow events as closely as we'd like to. We can't form some of the relationships we want to form. And then when we want to do something with them, because sometimes you still have to work with a horrible regime, we have to, like, for instance, in Iran, we have to go through the Swedes and the Germans. Um, so there is a reason, in fact, to do the opposite of our instinct, which is when we renounce a country, and sometimes we should, if we can, Double down on studying that area. Double down on building connections. Now, of course, you have to be careful about espionage. And the last thing we want, we've had this challenge, right, are the Chinese using uh, Chinese study centers in the U.S. as covers for espionage. That has to be policed. But that should not be an excuse to stop studying China, to stop studying Russia. The last time I was in China, I gave three lectures to audiences, I don't know, two to 400 students at uh, Baida University and a few other places. I did that in English. They listened and asked, asked questions in English. Could I do that at an American university? Who has the advantage there? They study us more than we study them, right? I'm sure the Iranians study us more than we study them, right? That's, that's not the way it should work. More connection and more study of those that we think are the most threatening. Well, I think that is a fantastic uh, call to action to end on, and uh, this conversation is Absolutely wonderful. Well, thank I've you, enjoyed Dr. it Sir. very much, Nicholas. Thank yeah. you.